Hello. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome everyone today to the first Vaughn Grand Rounds of 2024. Today we'll be focusing on a topic important to all of us, the infant and family experience in neonatal intensive care, management of pain and discomfort in critically ill infants. I'll be one of today's moderators. My name is Danielle Eret. I serve as the Osfeld Yamaru Green and Gold Professor of Global Health, the Chief Medical Officer and Director of Global Health at Vermont Oxford Network. My co-moderator today is Roger Saul, the H. W. the H. Wallace Professor of Neonatology at University of Vermont, Coordinating Editor for Cocker Neonatal, and our Director for the Vaughn Institute of Evidence-Based Practice. We also have two fantastic discussants with us today, Elizabeth Rogers, Professor of Pediatrics at the UCSF School of Medicine, Director of the Roots Small Baby Program and the Intensive Care Nursery at UCSF Mission Bay, and Christopher McPherson, a Clinical Pharmacy Specialist and St. Louis at St. Louis Children's Hospital and Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Washington University School of Medicine. Today's Grand Round session is sponsored by the Vermont Oxford Network and our Institute of Evidence-Based Practice. Cochrane Neonatal also received unrestricted grant support to create and update reviews on the infant and family experience in the neonatal intensive care from the Gerber Foundation. Here are our um, disclosures relevant to our topic for today. And just a quick reminder of how to participate in today's webinar. We have a chat and we expect with today's topic it to be a robust chat. Please put in chat questions, comments, and put them to everyone. And we'll see if we can get to some of those during our open question and answer session. We'll also have several Zoom polls during our session today. And those will pop up in Zoom and you can click your answers and press submit. So to, to practice and to get us started, here's our first Zoom poll. Do you have written guidelines that address the issue of pain and discomfort for infants? This is a check all that apply type of question. And so we're curious about your practices for undergoing painful procedures, infants on mechanical ventilation, infants recovering from surgery, and infants on therapeutic hypothermia. We'll give about 15 and 20 seconds for everyone to answer. And then we'll see um, how everyone tuning in today uh, has prepared. All right, looks like we have over 570 people tuned in and let's see what variation we have. We have about 80% of those have guidelines in place for painful procedures. The next most common is for infants recovering from surgery, about 57% have guidelines, just over half for infants on therapeutic hypothermia, and about 39% on mechanical ventilation. That'll be very interesting as we get into our um, discussion today to see how um, that is uh, touches on the evidence that we have. So next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Roger Saul, um, who will be um, reviewing the evidence as we talk about evidence to practice of the management of pain and discomfort in critically ill infants. Dr. Saul. Thanks, Danielle. I'm gonna take this opportunity to discuss the management of pain and discomfort in critically ill infants in our NICUs and discuss the evidence and the practice that we currently engage in. Pain has become a very important issue as we contemplate what constitutes humane and appropriate care in the neonate. In this series of web seminars, we want to discuss a variety of issues. In our previous seminar, we discussed the management of acute procedural pain and addressed some of the issues around pain scales and issues of trying to avoid procedural pain, poke. Today, we're going to discuss the management of longer term pain and discomfort associated with mechanical ventilation or surgical procedures. And in our final seminar next year, we'll discuss the impact of intensive care environment and developmental care practices on infant development. But let's just take a step back to remind ourselves of why this is such an important issue to the care of our infants. We know that there is incredible stress associated with neonatal intensive care. Although we've made significant strides towards decreasing mortality in preterm infants, 
many of our surviving infants experience significant developmental problems in both motor and intellectual development. This stressful environment we place these infants in is a double-edged sword contributing to both of these phenomena, improving survival, but also perhaps contributing to concerning developmental outcomes. The stresses inherent to neonatal intensive care include the need for frequent painful procedures and the topics we're discussing today, the pain associated with mechanical ventilation and magical surgical interventions, and perhaps I should say the pain and discomfort of these interventions. And the overall environment of neonatal intensive care is also vastly different than the experience of the infant prior to delivery. In response to studies that have shown us that pain affects infants negatively, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended that we have written guidelines based on existing and emerging evidence for a stepwise pain prevention and treatment plan. And this would include judicious use of procedures, routine assessment of pain, and use of both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies. They note though, although this is easy to, to say, in fact, deciding how you'll incorporate this in practice is a challenge. Reports from NICUs across the world demonstrate that there is considerable room for improvement. So why do we care? What are the downstream effects of pain in hospitalized neonates? Well, first, it is no longer debated that preterm infants have the necessary architecture to have a response and a um, pain perspective. When we think about the prevention and alleviation of pain, particularly in preterm infants, it's important because it's not only ethical, but also because exposure to repeated painful stimuli early in life is known to have short-term and long-term sequelae. These sequelae range from truly short-term, like physiologic instability, to long-term concerns, like altered brain development and abnormal neurodevelopment that can persist well into childhood. So let's take a look at those patients that we discussed that are exposed to longer-term intensive care, the critically ill infant, and how we can manage their pain and discomfort. Not unlike our discussion of the short-term exposure to painful procedures like blood draws or um, skin pokes, optimal management requires some aspect of pain assessment. In our previous discussions, when we thought about pain assessment, it was more an outcome measure of our intervention. But when it comes to the critically ill infant, pain assessment tools can be used both to assess the need for an intervention as well as the response to an intervention. For routine assessment of pain, most of the scores include a variety of physiologic indicators, including heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, vagal tone, palmar sweating, and sometimes even um, blood tests, including following plasma cortisol or catecholamines. Behavioral indicators of pain may include assessment of facial expressions, body movements, and crying. But when it comes to the critically ill infant, perhaps we have to think beyond just pain and think of how we address the issue of discomfort. And that brings in the need for a different assessment, and also the possibility of drugs other than those specifically directed at analgesia that might have positive effects for these infants. One such scale to evaluate discomfort is the comfort neo scale, which has some overlapping domains with some of the traditional pain scales, but also has some subtle differences. Comfort neo, for example, assesses alertness, calmness or agitation, respiratory response, crying, body movements, facial tension, and body muscle tone. In early publications, it clearly shows that the scoring based on Comfort Neo for the intervention and after clearly shows us positive responses and the fact that the score does um, indicate changes 
in underlying comfort or pain. The scale has been questioned in terms of this inter-rater uh, reliability, but nevertheless, an important distinction about what we need to measure, particularly in this population. So let's discuss these kids. Who are they? And there are three groups I'd like to share with you today. The kids who are on mechanical ventilation, the kids who are immediately going to surgery or post-hop, op, and the issue of therapeutic hypothermia. When it comes to mechanical ventilation, there are three systematic reviews that address potential approaches to managing pain and discomfort. One is opioids for newborns receiving mechanical ventilation. The other is dexmetopamine for analgesia and sedation in newborns on mechanical ventilation. And the last review I'll share with you is on intravenous midazolam infusion. So let's start with the biggest of these reviews that has the most evidence behind it. Roberto Ballou's review of opioids for newborn infants receiving mechanical ventilation. The objectives of this review were to look at the benefits of harms of opioid analgesia, and they included in this review both term and preterm infants. In infants receiving mechanical ventilation compared to placebo, no drug, other opioids, or other analgesics. Ultimately, they found reviews that addressed both term and preterm infants, and they included any duration of drug and any dosage that were given. They identified a fair number of trials involving over 2,000 infants. 15 of these studies are those that we're going to focus on. These involved 1,632 infants, and they directly compared the use of morphine or fentanyl versus placebo or no interventions. Most of these studies were done in preterm infants. Here's the forest plot looking at pain scores. And it is divided here into scores immediately after starting the opioid, namely less than 12 hours after infusion. And then in the 12 to 48 hour uh, period after the infusion has been started. And what they showed is that the mean difference of pain scores was reduced when using opioids in infants receiving mechanical ventilation. That reduction was profound in the infants uh, when they measured PIP scores at less than 12 hours with an almost six point reduction in the scores, but was somewhat attenuated by 12 to 48 hours with only about a one point reduction in the scores and a confidence interval that although statistically significant may not be particularly clinically relevant. When they looked at other important clinical outcomes that were reported in these studies, we find that there is somewhat concerning uh, signals. Yes, we saw a reduction in the PIP scores, but we saw no change in mechanical ventilation, no change in neonatal mortality, no change in severe intraventricular hemorrhage, and a concerning increase in the risk of hypotension in the infants who received the opioids. In addition, although the confidence interval is extraordinarily broad and therefore very imprecise, in the one study that reported neurodevelopment, we see that there is no uh, message that there is an impact of this more aggressive therapy of opioids in kids on mechanical ventilation. So the authors conclude that they're uncertain whether opioids have an effect on developmental outcomes, and there's little or no effect involving short-term outcomes such as mechanical ventilation or neonatal mortality. The data on the other comparisons that they planned, namely opioids versus other analgesics or comparing two different opioid preparations was very limited and does not allow any conclusions. In the absence of firm evidence to support such a routine policies, they argue that opioids should be used selectively based on clinical judgment and evaluation of pain indicators and not as a routine infusion of children on mechanical ventilation. So how has the community evolved and taken in this information? What is our current practice regarding opioids? Well, probably the first survey of practice that addressed these issues is now over a decade old, and it is the Europain results. 
The European study was a prospective cohort study of the management of sedation and analgesia in patients in NICUs. There are over 6,000 infants enrolled at 243 NICUs in 18 European countries. In infants who were given uh, tracheal ventilation, opioids were used in 82% of those patients and less so in other forms of ventilation, such as non-invasive ventilation um, and infants who are breathing spontaneously. Opioids were given to 74% of the neonates in the traditional endotracheal tube ventilation group, midazolam to 25% of neonates in the ET ventilation group, TV here, and neuromuscular blockers were administered in 7% of those infants. In a univariate analysis, neonates given opioids, sedative hypnotics, or general anesthesia in the traditional ventilation group needed longer duration of ventilation than those not given these drugs. What about some more recent data from surveys? Here we have the work on the association between opioid use during mechanical ventilation and the evidence of brain injury which also included a survey of practices. The goal of this study was to quantify the use of opioids during mechanical ventilation in preterm infants less than 32 weeks gestation. It's a retrospective propensity score match cohort study in data that was routinely collected from the National Neonatal Research Database in infants 22 to 31 weeks gestation. This included over 67,000 infants of whom 67% were mechanically ventilated for one or more days. Opioids were frequently given to these infants uh, for a median of 67% of the ventilated days. The percentage of mechanically ventilated infants who received opioids while ventilated actually increased between 2012 and 2020 from 52% to 60%. In the propensity scored matched cohort, the odds of any preterm brain injury was higher in those who received opioids compared to those who did not. So not only is this practice increasing in all infants less than 32 weeks, but particularly here in infants greater, less than 28 weeks gestation, we know that there are concerning outcomes in the infants who were treated with opioids. The authors conclude that the use of opioids has actually increased despite the lack of support from randomized trials. And although causation cannot be determined, among those ventilated for greater than two consecutive data, the, the data suggests that opioid use is associated with an increased risk of preterm brain injury and risks associated with longer durations of exposure. So moving from opioids, People have asked, well, if that's not necessarily the best choice, are there other reasonable choices to consider? And there are at least two other agents that have been well studied. The first is dexmetopamine. And here's the Cochrane Review looking at dexmetopamine for analgesia and sedation in infants receiving mechanical ventilation. Just to back up, dexmetopamine is a highly selective alpha-2 adrenergic receptor agonist that provides analgesia, anxiolysis, and sedation, and it has the potential to augment or even replace opioids or benzodiazepines in the treatment of these chronically, mechanically ventilated preterm infants. Clinical in pre data in preterm infants suggests that it might be more efficacious than opioids and does not have some of the problems associated with opioids, such as respiratory depression, or gastrointestinal dysmobility. Preclinical data shows the possibility of longer term benefits, such as the possibility of neuroprotection. Robust safety and efficacy data are needed before usage can be evaluated. And so the authors did a systematic review looking for randomized trials that evaluated dexmetopamine in mechanically ventilated infants. And here's what they found, a goose egg, nothing, nada, 
Despite the increasing use of dexmetopamine, there is no evidence supporting its routine use for analgesia and sedation in newborn infants on mechanical ventilation. The data on safety is scarce, and there is no data on long-term benefits. The authors of this review did identify some ongoing studies, and so we're hoping that there is some evidence coming down the pike. But it is interesting that this drug has increased in its popularity uh, with so little evidence behind it. Let's take a look at another alternative for treatment, and that's intravenous midazolam for sedation of infants in neonatal intensive care. The rationale is clear. Benzodiazepines administered as intravenous infusions or as boluses can be used to provide sedation, not analgesia, in many clinical settings. And midazolam, midazolam has been one of the best choices. Uh, it's preferred because of its water solubility and its rapid clearance. There are a few trials that have addressed this in very few infants. Three randomized controlled trials, 148 infants. Using different sedation scales, each study showed a statistically significant higher sedation level with midazolam. However, the duration of NICU stay was significantly longer. So what we see here is a uh, increase in the length of NICU stay that was not insignificant. The point estimate was of five days, but it could be as little as half a day or as much as 10 days, and no difference regarding duration of mechanical ventilation, supplemental oxygen, mortality, or IVH. So where does this take us in terms of the existing guidelines and recommendations? It's interesting in my search for these guidelines that there are no single authoritative organizations that have published guidelines that we can all look to and say this represents a national or international norm. But there are some very well-educated expert reviews and statements on the subject. And it's worth taking a look at to see how they approach this evidence. Probably the best um, publication I found on the subject was Chris McPherson's publication regarding practical approaches to sedation and analgesia in the newborn. And of course, this is why I've asked Chris to be one of our uh, discussants on this. Their recommendations do fit what we know not to do. Continuous analgesia or sedation should be avoided in preterm infants undergoing short durations of invasive mechanical ventilation. For prolonged mechanical ventilation, non-pharmacologic therapy, including appropriate containment and sensory environment is vital. And they note, as you've seen from the paucity of evidence and the evidence that shows some concerning effects, that controversy exists regarding the role of continuous analgesia or sedation in preterm infants requiring prolonged mechanical ventilation. Not dissimilar, there are some statements regarding the use of pain and sedation from the European Consensus Guidelines, here looking at the most recent update in 2022. They note that there's a balance between appropriate analgesia and the negative effects of sedation, particularly when there is an emphasis on minimizing the duration of mechanical ventilation. And again, they tell us what not to do, namely routine sedation for ventilated infants is not recommended, but they do suggest that there is a population that it must be used selectively in based on clinical judgment and evaluation of pain. A review from Italy is a little bit more specific about their recommendations. They came up with five very strong recommendations, some of which seem evidence-based and others just seem to be expert opinion. They do note that using non-pharmacologic analgesia is a reasonable approach. They favor intermittent boluses of opioids administered after pain scores or before invasive procedures. They do not recommend the use of morphine infusions in preterm infants less than 27 weeks gestation. And they do address the use of pain meds uh, for endotracheal intubation. So let's move on to other aspects of the pain and discomfort experience of critically ill newborns in our NICU and discuss the use of system, systemic opioid regimens in post-operative pain. Towards this, there are seven trials, but again, 
very few infants, only 504 infants. None of the included studies reported data on clinically important outcomes, such as mortality rate during hospitalization or developmental disability or instance of other major complications that might be related, such as retinopathy of prematurity or IVH. And there's very limited data available on the approach to using these opioids, whether continuous infusion or intermittent boluses are better. Here, looking at post-operative care of infants, the use of continuous versus intermittent morphine probably has little or no effect on reducing pain scores, so they both seem to be appropriate results. There is, of course, a very interesting uh, issue regarding anesthesia during surgery and immediately post-op as to whether or not regional anesthesia, including spinal, epidural, or caudal anesthesia versus general anesthesia is best, particularly in a population that we frequently send to the operating room, those infants who have an inguinal hernia. In the initial review in 2015, there were only five small trials identified. And again, in these studies, there can be very few infants, namely 147 infants. In this initial review, there were no differences seen in apnea or bradycardia, in oxygen desaturation, in post-operative respiratory support. There was an increased risk of failure of anesthesia placement in the infants who were randomized to spinal anesthesia. I suppose this comes as no surprise and may be really more an issue of a learning curve that is necessary but there is no reason to assume that spinal anesthesia will be better for short-term outcomes than general anesthesia. What people worry about though, when it comes to this issue of general anesthesia is the downstream developmental issues that have been voiced as a concern. And here I'm gonna take you back to one large study that was not included in this review. And that is the study of uh, Davidson and colleagues, the so-called GAS study, looking at the neurodevelopmental outcome at two years of age after general anesthesia versus awake regional anesthesia. This is a trial uh, that looked at developmental outcome in these infants. They wound up enrolling 363 infants. And although that's not a large number, that's twice as many infants as were evaluated in all the previous trials. And what they found is that there was no difference in the various developmental assessments, including cognitive composite score. For secondary outcomes, they found no evidence uh, that short periods of general anesthesia increase the risk of neurodevelopmental outcome at two or three years of age. So let's move to one final set of patients to discuss how we address their pain and discomfort and that is sedation of the term neonate during therapeutic hypothermia. We all know that therapeutic hypothermia has become the standard of care for neonates with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. But as we witness it, it seems associated with a great deal of physiologic distress. And there's some proof in infants who've been tested of elevated circulating cortisol and norepinephrine levels that makes us think that this might be a particularly stressful and discomforting experience. When we looked at a uh, systematic review of pharmacologic interventions for pain and sedation in the management of newborns undergoing uh, therapeutic hypothermia, we again came up with nothing. There are no such studies. Um, so then the question is, in this absence of evidence, what do we know? about the use of analgesia and sedation in those neonates. Well, there is a scoping review looking at what we know about analgesia and sedation, and it comes up with a few very interesting findings. One, as I stated, there are no randomized controlled trials, but they did look within the trials about what was used, and it was really very interesting. There was only one study in Europe uh, that protocolized the use of pain and, and, and um, sedation in these infants. But in the other studies, there was a great deal of open label use. 
Here is a list of the pharmacologic agents that were used in these studies for the purpose of sedation and analgesia. And you can see that far and away, morphine was the most frequently used agent in well over 60% of the studies, uh, followed by fentanyl and midazolam. And so the vast majority of studies did use some agent in an open label fashion. One such study is the major study from the NICHD when they looked at their initial cooling studies. And there are secondary publications from that. Here, from Natarajan and colleagues, the association between sedation, analgesia, and developmental outcomes in these infants who receive therapeutic hypothermia. They took a look at 208 of the participants in their initial randomized control trial and noted that only 18% had no exposure to sedation, analgesia, or anticonvulsants. So that means 82% received some form of sedation, analgesia, or anticonvulsants. At 18 months of age, disability among survivors and death or disability was more frequent in the groups that received anticonvulsants, 48% versus 65%. Sedation analgesia groups were somewhat similar. So when they did this analysis, they noted that anticonvulsant treatment was associated with an increased risk of disability among survivors, but the sedation and analgesia was not. This becomes one of those half full or half empty sort of arguments. Sedation and analgesia did not improve the outcome, but did not necessarily seem harmful to these infants. Again, we'll look to Chris McPherson for some expert opinion on this, a recent publication on the management of comfort and sedation in neonates receiving therapeutic hypothermia gives us a few guidelines to consider. They note that pharmacologic sedatives may be indicated in this population uh, and may mitigate uh, the intensity of neurotoxicity of the hypoxic ischemic result. Morphine represents the current standard of care with a history of utilization and extensive pharmacokinetic data. They suggest that dexmetopamine might be an alternative as is considered an alternative in the population of kids on mechanical ventilation but there is very little data to support this. Specifically, they suggest that non-pharmacologic approaches may be important, that benzodiazepines should be avoided. They have specific recommendations regarding morphine and the potential of low-dose dexmetopamine. But I think more importantly, they identify the research directions that need to be taken and that we need to study this issue across a broad variety of patients to understand the safety, efficacy, and long-term outcomes of the use of sedation and analgesia in this population. So now at this time, I'm going to turn things back to Danielle. We'll introduce our guest discussants, Dr. Elizabeth Rogers and Dr. Chris McPherson, who will give us some insights about their practice and their views on this evidence about how we should best minimize pain and discomfort in critically ill infants. Where do they take this evidence and what do they think are the best practices regarding minimizing pain and discomfort? So thank you. Roger, thank you for that in-depth review of the available evidence. And I'm excited now to have some time to hear from our two discussants, invite them to share some comments. And then at the end, we'll have some time for open Q&A and incorporating some great points that we've seen in the chat. And first up, let's hear from Chris McPherson from the perspective of a clinical pharmacist, leading academic in the field, and as I know, an integral member of his neonatal multidisciplinary care team. Over to you, Chris. Yeah, so I'll keep my comments brief because um, that I think it's come through in the chat and it's come through in review of the evidence that pharmacy pharmacists don't have and pharmacy is not the answer to this question. Uh, it's certainly a part of the care, a, a, a vital part of the care of many infants. Um, I was really intrigued that the guidelines, 80% of units have guidelines for painful procedures. That's a relatively uh, 
straightforward situation that you can protocolize, but only 40% of respondents have one for mechanical ventilation. That's because we don't have the answer for mechanical ventilation. I think my advice for units that don't have guidelines is that not having the answer doesn't prevent these patients from showing you that some will require interventions and some not. So a one size fits all approach that's captured by a really nice Cochrane review, I don't think is ever coming in this space. Patient assessment is vital uh, to the best of your ability. There's no perfect answer on patient assessment either, but using the same tool throughout your unit and having all your nurses trained on that approach is vital to minimizing exposure to pharmacologic agents, limiting that exposure to only appropriate circumstances. That's going to be the safest approach for your babies. And then as referenced in the chat earlier, publishing your results. Um, there's a really nice reference that was posted in the chat from the group in Rochester that was really focused on safety in terms of reducing unplanned extubations after optimal post-surgical pain management centered around non-pharmacologic care as well as acetaminophen, an agent with less pharmacologic adverse effects than the standard morphine. So the goal is not to get to zero in terms of drugs. The goal is to get to appropriate dosing, appropriate patient selection, and then optimizing non-pharmacologic interventions to minimize those toxic exposures for babies in a diverse set of clinical circumstances that make up the population of our NICU. Thanks, Chris. And, and I hope another key point that everyone here tuned in, we have over 900 uh, participants in the webinar, is also to know having a pharmacist on their team to help make these guidelines assess, weigh the risks and the benefits of anything that we do, you know, really is integral. Um, and I know we'll have some more questions for you as we get into the Q&A period. So I'll maybe turn it over to uh, Liz Rogers and invite her comments. Um, Liz is a clinical leader and a stellar advocate for neuroprotective care for all babies. Um, over to you, Liz, and thank you. Thanks so much, Danielle, Chris, and Roger for that great review. Um, I will just say, um, thanks for the great introduction. No more need for, for that. But I'll say that we are all in the business of survival and thrival. And that's the whole focus of our current Vaughn Collaborative All Cares Brain Care. So where procedures that may cause pain or discomfort are necessary for survival, we want to do them efficiently well and mitigate the potential harm we know these procedures can cause. And as Drs. Saul and McPherson have pointed out, pharmacological management of pain in these circumstances may be crucial um, and also have their own potential negative side effects. So finding balance at the bedside is key. And I would venture it's not the kind of balance where you have two objects on a scale, but rather that of a juggler with five burning balls in the air. And one or two of those balls may be morphine or fentanyl. But my guess is that many of you working at the bedside are thinking of all these non-pharmacologic ways that you provide comfort and treat or minimize pain. So three areas that I think about optimizing most at the bedside are minimizing the harm of a necessary procedure that you've determined to be necessary. And this might happen through using simulation to practice and standardize and get as good as possible before you reach the patient at that particular procedure. It might involve point of care ultrasound, for example, to really get to precision um, with a particular procedure or it might involve having guidelines. For example, one that we've made, albeit quite thoughtfully and with um, a lot of consideration, to use the most ex experienced provider for a particularly high risk procedure um, for an infant, um, uh, recognizing that our learners also um, need experience. So next, I think critically, actively managing the environment um, and providing some positive sensory mitigators to the pain and discomfort. And this may look very different in each local context, but it may consist of uh, containment, clustering care that, that needs to happen that, that's necessary, um, reduction of noxious stimuli, promotion of these positive sensory experiences through parental touch, skin-to-skin -skin contact, 
um, replacing disordered noise of loud alarms with the therapeutic parental voice, you know, managing light and sound exposure, for example. But um, I'll just venture to say that I think avoiding the procedure altogether may be the answer in many cases. So units have gone through that have gone through a discernment process, such as the POKE project with Eric Rideout and his group in the Air Mountain Health System, um, have shown that reducing these necessary tests have um, considerable improvements in both care practices and outcomes. So we all have experiences getting a routine morning lab that we didn't think twice about checking the box on the admission order set a week before. Um, it requires a skin break. Uh, it goes to the lab and it gets delayed, therefore results in an abnormal value. Then you require another skin break to confirm that it was actually normal. And possibly you've also led to a treatment along the way that was unnecessary. So I think this framework of reducing procedures can apply to more than just pokes, might consider the use of non-invasive ventilation where possible, or other ways to reduce the invasiveness or negative impacts of the care we're providing. So many of us, for example, actually have policies that restrict the use of skin-to-skin -skin contact for infants who are agitated, who are on a mechanical ventilator for fear of an unplanned extubation, or accidental dislodgement of a chest tube or an umbilical line, or while undergoing therapeutic hypothermia. Instead, we may opt for a dose of morphine or a benzodiazepine. And for many preterm and term neonates, they may then ride that ventilator for another day as they metabolize the drug. And we may have missed a critical window for parental engagement, parental efficacy, not to mention a window to get them on to non-invasive support or to advance feeding. So, um, Many of these support neurosupportive interventions, like the pharmacologic agents we've been discussing, lack the clear evidence of benefit due to the many methodologic challenges of studying these in standard RCTs, for example, but they absolutely have plausibility for benefit um, and certainly no harm. So when we involve families and provide positive environments, we know we improve outcomes for infants and their families. So we're excited about studies like this, like the PEDAL study, um, using uh, quite um, quite advanced and involved science um, to examine whether parental touch will decrease pain and pain responses during a neonatal heel lance. So more studies like this and building the evidence base will be hugely influential to moving non-pharmacologic approaches to pain management forward. So treating pain in newborns like protecting the neonatal brain doesn't seem to have a silver bullet, but approaching it from a culture of minimizing harm uh, for caring for ourselves and each other so we can do the hard work day in and day out and giving our families autonomy um, to be full team members and provide care that only they can give are essential cultural shifts. Uh, we do all these three and it may not be fully evidence-based yet, uh, but I think we'll use less morphine. And happy Valentine's Day from our unit to all of you out there. Thank you, Liz, and happy Valentine's Day to you. We're both wearing our red today. Um, for, so for those who are celebrating, uh, that was a fantastic overview. Thank you so much. And you raised some really important topics about non-pharmacologic management. So we have, this is our final poll for all of those joining in today. So we've heard what your guidelines are for some of the pharmacologic management. Now we're curious to hear how you incorporate non-pharmacologic management in the care of critically and critically ill infants. This also was a check all but apply. So some options we have listed are containment, facilitated tucking or swaddling, skin to skin care, breast or chest feeding, parental touch, non-nutritive sucking with or without sucrose, um, and the use of control of noise and light in the environment. So I'll give about 15 to 20 seconds to hear um, how many teams and units are incorporating non-farm into their approach uh, for caring for these infants for pain, discomfort. And I'm so excited that we have um, a good amount of time to have some wonderful questions that have come up in the chat. And we're gonna have a very international answer. I've, it's been wonderful to see where everyone is joining in from today. So it looks like our our crew is doing some fantastic non-pharmacologic care. I think that's my initial reaction to this poll. Um, close to 90% for many of these um, topics. Uh, Liz, I don't know if you have any other comments, but I'm thrilled to see how prevalent this is. 
Yeah, I think this is really um, exciting and certainly should be part of, of those balls that you're juggling in the air. Um, and I'll just remark on kind of breast and chest feeding as being, I think, a, a route that we have to consider sort of reducing the variation or increasing the use of um, during painful procedures. Certainly, we have great models for that. All right, so now we do have some time for some um, questions. So just a reminder, um, if you want to send in comments or questions, please use the um, chat to everyone so we can all see and learn from it. We know we won't be able to get to all of the great comments that are put in there, but um, we're also trying to answer them in real time. The first really um, major topic that I saw come up many, many times in the chat, um, I think you've addressed it a little bit in the chat, Chris, but maybe to start off with, you know, 900 plus of us are all here because we just want to do the best we can to care for infants and their families. Um, and the concept of assessing pain, comfort, whether we need sedation or not is really challenging. There's, there are many different tools, um, different tools for different indications, there are different gestations, and it can be a little bit, you know, daunting. Um, so I was curious if you have some take home points on that or some resources to point us to um, maybe to get this conversation started? Short answer is absolutely not. Um, I'm not an expert in assessment. Um, I try to give the babies their space and let the physicians and the nurses uh, do the touching. Um, I think that the, the, the feedback I can give as a pharmacist is dig into the great review articles written by experts in the field on the pros and cons of different assessment techniques. I think at last count, there are around 50 or 60 options. So the idea that in the chat, we use this, we use that, this one's not validated here, this one's not validated there. You're not gonna get away with one scale for your entire NICU population, inclusive of both a 22 weeker and a 42 weeker, as well as comfort and pain in that diverse population. So, but the point being, I'm not gonna endorse a scale because I don't have that expertise, but you as a unit need to select a, a, a limited group of scales that captures your patient populations and the situations that you see in your unit and staff need to be trained on them over and over and over again. And I appreciate that that's an investment of time and resources, but it's worth it based on the number of attendees in this forum and the, the amount of chat and I guess discomfort among the, the providers and not to mention the babies. And then discuss these things on multidisciplinary rounds. The resident just shouldn't be reading pain scores without context. That's why we have multidisciplinary rounds. So the nurse can give her gestalt of what's going on with that baby in addition to the scores. Um, so the scores are a tool, the scores are a vital tool. Um, but they're only one small piece of the puzzle that will inform decisions made by the multidisciplinary team about deployment of agents that act neurologically in a very, very, very important stage of neurodevelopment and have toxicities. So that's not to say we shouldn't use the agents, but we shouldn't use take their use lightly. Um, it, figuring out this assessment piece for your unit is as vital as anything you're doing. Thank you. And sorry, I wasn't thinking you would say this one and this one and this one. All set. No, no more to learn. Um, any uh, comments or additions to that, Les or Roger? No, just well, to say, I, I agree. Sorry. Like so many QI methodologies, standardization, get your whole unit comfortable and bought into whichever tool you're using and then and then put it to, you know, put it to to good use. So I wonder, though, Chris, because in our discussions before when we were performing the talk, you reminded me, make sure that I address discomfort as something uniquely different from pain. And is it important that we as caregivers at the bedside think about those, the difference between the two, what our goal, what we think is going on, what our goals are, and perhaps choose tools that are best aligned to assess and follow that? I would say absolutely yes, right? Because the interventions are going to be vastly different if you're talking about acute pain from a procedure like an intubation or a surgery versus chronic agitation from a mechanical ventilator that's misaligned with the baby's um, clinical status potentially. So you're in, in one case, you're thinking about 
heavily evidence-based intermittent analgesia, which I don't think there's any argument about that that's standard of care in neonates. But in the other scenario, you're thinking about a continuous infusion of, is it morphine? Is it fentanyl? Is it midazolam? Is it dexmetomidine? The, the assessment, the thought process, the contextualization has to be very different. Um, and, and I think that in my mind requires vastly different tools. I, I agree completely. It reminds me of how we vet, we all learn to ventilate the sick preterm with the non-compliant lung. And then we continue those strategies six weeks later. Okay. And we don't understand that the patient is changing, the situation is changing, and our approaches need to change. I guess there is one standard, and that's what Liz brought out. We always have to be caring about the developmental issues and think about the comfort and non-pharmacologic care in all situations. But I do think we tend to use the wrong tools and the wrong approach, uh, and therefore also the wrong drugs, uh, depending on the situation. Another um, important topic I saw in the chat, which was a um, maybe a framing that is new to some of our audience, is the concept of opioid stewardship. You know, many of us have been attuned to antibiotic stewardship and wanting, you know, to have that Goldilocks um, approach. We want to treat the right babies with the right medication at the right time and not overtreat those that don't need it um, and having a standard approach uh, to that. I was curious if anyone wants to chat about um, kind of if that's a new concept to a unit, if they're working on standardizing care, um, is this something that they, you know, could be measuring as they're trying to make sure that they're not over treating babies that don't need um, pharmacologic care? Um, any comments on on this kind of new framing that might be uh, a new topic to teams? Yeah, I think it's very measurable. Um, you can use very similar methodology that's been for used for years and antimicrobial stewardship and then quality improvement work writ large. So, you know, number go down, right, is, is, is the goal of all stewardship. But, you know, in, in antimicrobial stewardship, as in this space, it's really important to acknowledge that these drugs are vitally, vitally important to a subset of patients, just probably not the broad subset that get exposed to them in a large intensive care unit. So, make the number go down. Yes, but balancing measures, right? Do that safely. Um, ensure that your unplanned extubation rates in the Rochester example aren't going up and that's for acute, but you know, that's also a valid measure for sedation and babies on mechanical ventilation. None of these measures are perfect. And I wouldn't, you know, as vital as I think pain scale scores are, I wouldn't necessarily track QI against pain scale score evolution because that should be more individualized than broadly applied across a unit. So, but, but I think the QI methodology that's been so useful in ASP is really useful here as well. And I'll just add, I think Danielle, that a stewardship program, if you think about it from like a positive organizational psychology perspective, when you, when you name something and define it and you have a goal, um, I think, first of all, it points out to the whole team that, that very often in the in the population we're caring for, less is more. So it reminds people constantly of what the goal is, which is to minimize side effects of the of the you know care that we know was necessary. So it's sort of that philosophy, and then also putting resources into a program, like Chris said, so that you do track it, so that you're you know so that you're looking at your metrics frequently. And I think once you solidify it under a program, you often can then you know, get some executive sponsorship for some pharmacist time to help you, et cetera. So those two aspects of culture building that come through creation of a stewardship program, I think are important. And it implies that yes, you are going to ta start some kids on it, but you have a responsibility to manage it and reevaluate and minimize it. So it, 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 puts it in a very positive spin. It gets the whole team invested. I think it's a wonderful point that was brought up in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Liz. And I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think, you know, naming it, it makes sure that everyone on the team is on the same page, having that shared mental model, um, and that we are tracking balancing member measures, I think is, you know, really important um, to make sure that um, we're hitting that, you know, the right population. So fantastic.
Um, we do have a, a few more, you know, minutes. I was curious, uh, Liz or Chris, if there were things that you saw in the chat that you wanted to take a few minutes to um, respond to. I know you've been quickly uh, typing away. Chris has been better at typing than I have. Um, so I appreciate that. I lost in the last 15 minutes. I totally <laughs> lost control. <laughs> I do want to acknowledge so many people have brought up the many, many people on their teams who contribute. And I, and I want to absolutely highlight that, that we could not provide um, control for pain or, or mitigate pain and discomfort without music therapists, child life therapists, our OT, PTs, obviously our bedside nurses, and want to point out the critical, critical team member of families. So there are so many uh, folks who we need to engage in this work. Um, but I love a lot of the chat about child life. I will say we've recently instituted um, a child life, our child life specialist now attends every ROP screening exam. And that was actually mentioned in the chat as well. Uh, but I will say our ophthalmologists have noted we have no A's and B's. Um, our infants recover very quickly after exam. It's been transformative. Um, and, and what it's been is containment and, um, you know, a little bit of sucrose and, you know, depending on what your local measures are, but having someone who is expressly dedicated to comfort during that procedure has um, changed our unit. So, um, so many team members and really wanted to highlight that. Um, and you might not have a music therapist, but then how can we, how can we use what you do have in terms of people power um, to get the team engaged and use those strengths that you do have? So I just, I really wanted to, um, you know, thank people for sharing all of the ways that team members can contribute. Such a key point. Thanks, Liz. And from a pharmacy perspective, there's, you know, vicious discord in the chat going on about sucrose right now um, and lots of other, you know, can you talk about ketamine? Can you talk about? The, so I think that the the sum on pharmacologic therapy from a pharmacy perspective is that you need a pharmacy perspective because there's evidence, both positive and negative um, of varying qualities for all of these agents. And the key is to select the agent that's most appropriate based on the best available data, and that might not be an RCT, and apply it as safely as possible in your unit. So treat your pharmacist right and have, you know, very active multidisciplinary discussions about what your unit should do with individual agents and then apply them across babies uniformly to figure out what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong when you apply QI methodology to those approaches. Yes, love for the pharmacist, love for the whole multidisciplinary care team on Valentine's Day and every day. Um, Roger, we've already heard the um, the encouragement for our teams to publish their quality improvement work, whether they're standardizing care, they're um, you know working on targeting the the right types of uh, patient populations from an evidence perspective. Um, any final words of wisdom or, or comments about where you um, see us going next? So, I mean, I, I was surprised that close to half of the groups had not thought about protocolizing some fairly routine situations. I, you know, the surgery cases, they are, they are very heterogeneous and their needs may be different, but I absolutely see um, sitting down and coming up with standards for the ventilated infant. And as you, as you heard from, from Liz in particular, um, well, how are you going to really get the family and everyone involved in the non-pharmacologic care? Our next seminar will be more about environment. There were some questions about music, et cetera, et cetera. But I think even for these basics, um, the ventilated kid deserves a little bit more attention from everyone from a QI perspective. And I think it's quite possible. And I think whatever you do in that will spread to the other chronic, the critically ill children uh, as you think it through. So that would be one of the first things I would hope people will tackle. Um. Great, thank you. And thank you to, to everyone who is joining in today. We've learned so much from the chatted in questions and comments. Um, this was really a wonderful conversation. Um, so we're sorry that the hour is already up, um, but we really appreciate everyone contributing, learning and sharing. Um, 
for everyone who has registered for this webinar, you'll receive an email with this code to get your CME. If you have many people in the room and you joined it on someone else's registration, um, uh, please use the QR code. You can um, sign up and get your continuing education credits um, in that way. Um, and there's been some questions about the video recording that will be on the Vaughn Public website um, uh, shortly. So you can watch it and share it with team members who weren't able to see it in real time. And I believe if you view it within the next 30 days, you're eligible to get the CME, even if you didn't join in exactly at this hour. Next up, and Roger alluded to our next evidence to practice session, which will be May 15th. We'll be focusing on the management of oxygen in preterm infants. And then later in the year, um, we're on preventing hypothermia, not treating with hypothermia. Um, and then uh, a session on follow-up and follow-through. These are all open to everyone. Um, we'll have CME and we hope to see you again throughout 2024. And if you really would like to dive in a bit more with quality improvement approach to neuroprotective care, um, we're welcoming teams to join the All Care is Brain Care Internet Based Quality Improvement Collaborative. And you can email us if you have any questions about that. Yeah, Thank you, you everyone, more, for joining us. Get more Liz. Today. More Liz. <laughs>